When it comes to college admissions, few factors are as anxiety producing as the SAT. After all, there's a lot riding on this one test, and many students have little experience with big tests of this nature until at least 11th grade. The SAT has included some kind of reading or verbal assessment on every test administration since the first one in 1926. Though the content has changed over the years, reading skills have always been and probably will always be a primary focus of the exam. Still, when the most recent changes were announced in 2014 and then were enacted in 2016, a wave of discomfort spread over college admissions advisors, high school students, and test prep experts. They asked questions like, what would the new test look like? How would test prep need to change to suit the new test? How would student performance on the new test measure up? Well, the results are in, and advisors, students, and test prep experts alike can all relax. Here at College Vine, our experts have poured over official data and materials from the College Board, all while pooling private resources and insights to create what we believe are the best tools and strategies in the industry. We're happy to be able to share some of those winning insights here with you today. In this video, we're going to walk you through how to prepare for the reading section of the SAT. Let's hop right in with our first tip. Number one, start early. The earlier you begin preparing for the SAT, the more thorough your prep will likely be. At College Vine, we don't recommend that you begin formal prep work before 11th grade, but we do believe that there are lots of things that you can do earlier than 11th grade to make sure that you're ready when it is time to begin with really serious studying. For example, as a ninth grader, you can begin to broaden your reading habits. You can try to gain exposure to a variety of high quality publications and read them regularly. That could include news from the New York Times, opinion pieces from The Economist, or reports from Science Magazine. By becoming familiar with the vocabulary, style, and informational graphics published in those works, you're going to be more ready to tackle similar styles when it comes time to really prepare for the SAT. In 10th grade, you could do something like beginning to follow the SAT question of the day on the College Board's Daily Practice app or you could join an SAT prep forum like those available from Khan Academy. These tools will help you to become familiar with the test content in a casual, no stress type of way. First semester of 11th grade is the perfect time to get really serious about preparing for the SAT. At College Find, we've encountered lots of smart students who believe that prepping for the SAT should take roughly four to six weeks. While those four to six weeks do represent a significant time drain for an average student, it's still just a scratch on the surface. To really prepare, absorb, and master all of the test knowledge and techniques that you'll need on exam day, you really need about roughly nine months to prepare for the test. Although it may seem excessive at first, remember that most students take the tests more than once, so allowing six months of prep before your first test date would leave you another three months of prep to improve before your second test date. Those nine months don't have to all be for one sitting. So are you ready to begin talking about what you'll do when you do begin prepping? The first thing that you want to do is take a formative assessment. These are tests or quizzes completed at the beginning of any studying endeavor. They're called formative assessments, and they're really the cornerstone of common teaching practice. So you probably remember the day that you walked into a classroom for the first time and surprise, your teacher hit you with a quiz on day one. It turns out that doing that wasn't an evil plan to destroy your GPA. It was a proven teaching strategy to pinpoint areas that needed improvement and to figure out which areas are already strong. So formative assessments are rooted in the idea that you can't learn something in a focused and concentrated way without having a realistic idea of where you're actually starting from and how to move forward from there. Teachers use formative assessments at the beginning of a class or a new unit to help guide their instruction but you can use the same strategy at the beginning of your own SAT prep as the most effective way to guide your study plan. You can either use an official practice test from the College Board as your formative assessment, or you can use your PSAT, which by the way, you should definitely take during the fall of 11th grade if there was any doubt about that. If you are taking a practice test, you'll need to follow the scoring guidelines to create your own score report. Otherwise, if you're using the PSAT, you can use the official PSAT score report that you'll receive after taking that exam. In either case, you need to carefully review your scores to reveal patterns in your errors. You need to look for errors that fall into the same content area or patterns in where your mistakes took place. You should classify mistakes according to the type of error you made. This could be specific content area knowledge, like identifying the writer's purpose, or it could be errors on a class of question type, like interpreting informational graphics. Mistakes that are clustered at the end of the test could be evidence of a pacing error, which is when you became really rushed as the time ran down. Mistakes at the end of the test could also be the result of test anxiety. Same for mistakes at the beginning of the test. 
Identifying patterns in your mistakes will give you a clear path of which areas are in need of most improvement, allowing you to better target your studying. Next, you want to use the results of your formative assessment to set a target score and make a study plan, which is really going to be the foundation of the rest of your test prep. Your target score will depend on a few different factors, namely which colleges you'd like to attend, how well you did on that practice test or the PSAT, and how much time you have left for prep and improvement, so how much you can realistically improve. You can check out our post, How to Set a Realistic Target SAT Score, which is linked in the comments below, for more help getting started coming up with that magic number. Then you want to use that target score to help guide your studying. It doesn't necessarily mean diving right into how you can use context to determine a word's meaning, but it might ultimately include that. What it does mean specifically is that you'll need to know the raw score that's most likely to yield the converted score that you've set as your target. Unfortunately, this isn't a precise science since each SAT sitting is scored slightly differently depending on its difficulty but you can get a general idea of how many questions you can afford to get wrong by looking at SAT raw score conversion charts for past reading SATs. A quick glance through the raw score conversion chart included in the scoring guide with the College Board's official practice tests will reveal that in order to achieve a perfect 800 on the reading test, you cannot miss any questions. To score a 750 on the evidence-based reading and writing section, you can miss up to nine questions on the reading section, as long as you don't miss any on the writing section, or you can miss up to six questions on the writing section if you don't miss any on the reading section. Of course, there are all sorts of combinations in between, so there's lots of ways, of course, to achieve that target number that you're looking for. A great study plan addresses the three major components of SAT prep. Those are number one, familiarity with the test, number two, content area knowledge, and number three, test strategy. Familiarity with the test is most gained by just repeated exposure to the test. You'll want to take plenty of practice tests, and of course you want to pay careful attention to the format of the test, the instructions for each section, and also, really important, the type of informational graphics that are commonly included with the passages. You really don't want to be wasting your time on test day reading instructions or learning how to use the key on the graph. Make sure that as you take practice tests, your knowledge of these test-specific resources is growing over time. This is the area of prep work that will grow the quickest as you naturally gain familiarity through experience with the SAT. As a quick review, the SAT reading test is part of the evidence-based reading and writing section of the SAT. Previously known simply as the verbal portion of the test, the section still focuses on critical reading and writing skills. The SAT reading test is comprised entirely of multiple choice questions based on passages. Specifically, it's 52 multiple choice questions based on five passages that you'll read and respond to over the course of 65 minutes, so an hour and five minutes. Each passage is between 500 to 750 words, unless it's paired with another passage, in which case the pair of passages together equals 500 to 750 words. The passages will always include a few things. One passage from a classic or contemporary work of US or world literature, one passage or a pair of passages from either a U.S. founding document or a text in the great global conversation they inspired, such as the U.S. Constitution or a speech by Nelson Mandela. There will be one passage about economics, psychology, sociology, or some other social science. There will be two science passages or one passage and one passage pair that examine foundational concepts and developments in earth science, biology, chemistry, or physics. Some of these passages, as I said, will be paired with other passages, and some passages will include additional informational graphics, such as tables, graphs, or charts. Once again, it's really important to be able to interpret those visuals, but keep in mind that no math is required on the part of the SAT. You just need to be able to interpret the graph. Content area knowledge on the reading test includes things like vocabulary, identifying an author's purpose, or comparing and contrasting two passages. On the SAT reading test, all of the questions are going to fall into one of the following categories. So let's go through them. Context clues. These questions will ask you to figure out which meaning of a word or phrase is being used or to decide how an author's word choice is shaping the overall meaning, style, or tone of a passage. Generally, these are the most specific types of questions and they're going to refer to an exact position in the text that they'll point you to. Another type is small scope. These questions are also highly specific, and they'll ask you to find evidence in a passage or a pair of passages that best supports the answer to a previous question or serves as the basis for a reasonable conclusion. These questions focus on what the passage says, whether directly or indirectly, 
and the answer can always be found explicitly in the text, though its location will be less clear than it is in the case of context clue questions. A third type of question is large scope. These questions generally ask you to consider a larger portion of the passage or the passage as a whole. You could be asked to identify how authors use evidence to support claims or how the author conveys meaning throughout the passage. Generally, to answer these questions, you'll need to consider the passage as a whole. Another type of question is the dual passage. These types of questions ask you to compare, contrast, or draw conclusions between multiple passages or passages paired with visual information. You'll be making connections, finding relationships between an infographic and a passage, or comparing how one idea is presented in two different ways. You'll need to consider not one, but two separate sources of information to answer these questions, which is what makes them unique. For some specific content area knowledge prep, we recommend starting with some of our top SAT prep blog posts. We think they're pretty helpful. So you can check the comment section below for links to our posts, 100 vocabulary words to know for the SAT, and how to tackle SAT paired passages. As far as SAT strategy goes on the reading section, we recommend that you be prepared to employ a few different approaches. So our first strategy is pacing. This pacing strategy is a bit personal, as only you can really know exactly how much time you typically need for reading versus answering versus checking your work. It's different for everyone. It's also something that you're going to fine tune over time. You'll learn more about yourself through the course of many practice tests. Remember that on the exam, you're gonna to need to read five full-length essays totaling around 3,000 words and answer 52 multiple choice questions in only 65 minutes. That's an average of 13 minutes per passage or an average of 75 seconds per question. Of course, you'll also wanna leave time to check your work, so your average pacing is likely slightly quicker than what I just outlined. That means that you should allow approximately 12 minutes for each passage. After you've finished the questions associated with the third passage, you wanna check your time. You should have between 25 and 30 minutes remaining. Though, of course, the more time you have left, the longer you'll have for review, which is not a bad thing. You just need to adjust your pacing if you know you've left lots of guesses to review at the end of the section, because obviously it will take you more time to go back and check your work. To accomplish this and your pacing strategy, you need to make sure you have a watch. Although most testing sites will have a clock in the room, it's not a guarantee, and you can't be certain that you'll be seated in a place where it's really easy to see the clock in the room. So you want to do yourself a favor and bring a watch to the SAT exam so you'll know how much time is remaining in a section at any given moment. Keep in mind though that a watch that makes any noise or serves any purpose other than keeping time is strictly prohibited, and using one could result in your task being confiscated and your scores being canceled. Definitely something you want to avoid. Another strategy related to pacing is skim reading. Reading efficiently is really a critical skill on the SAT reading test. Due to the length and the pace of the test, you're not going to be able to carefully read every word in every passage, consider each passage for relevance, and carefully underline important sections and circle key vocabulary. Those might be essential active reading skills that you practice in the rest of your life, but they're not really the most practical on the SAT. Instead, you need to practice reading efficiently by skimming the material first to give yourself a general idea of its format and content. There are many strategies for skimming text. Most involve reading the first and last sentence of every paragraph. Know your own speed and determine how much of the passages you can generally handle reading without suffering from a time crunch at the end of the test. If you are an exceptionally fast reader and know that you can read the entire introductory and concluding paragraphs with time to spare for each passage and its associated questions, then you should go ahead and do that. But if you know that you're not going to have time for that, Practice more efficient skimming strategies to ensure that you'll have time to skim every passage and the questions associated with each. Remember, you can't receive any points for a question that you didn't answer. So it's best to at least provide a guess for every question if it gets down to crunch time. Our final strategy is to learn the two passes strategy. This is a time management approach that will work on any section of the SAT. Applying it ensures that you have the time to answer questions on the test that are easiest for you and then come back later to the ones that are harder. If you run out of time before finishing every question, your score is going to suffer less because you've already answered the questions that you were most likely to get right. So to implement the two passes strategy, you wanna simply go through the entire section, completing all the questions with answers that are easily apparent, and then making a quick best guess on the questions seem, that seem like they'll require more time and energy on your part. As you do this two-pass strategy, you'll be very careful to mark each of those guess questions clearly on your answer sheet and on the text booklet. 
because filling out your best guess means that even if you run out of time before being able to review that guess, at least you've filled in an answer and you have at least a chance of getting it right. Remember, there's no scoring penalty for wrong guesses, so you should never leave a question blank. Remember that, never leave a question blank on the SAT. Once you've gone through every question, you just wanna go back to the ones that you've marked as guesses and give each one a little bit more thought. See if you can take it from a guess to a sure answer. If the answer still doesn't seem apparent to you, you should try to move on to another question that might be easier. You can even use this strategy in combination with the game plan for your target score by skipping only the number of questions that you can afford to get wrong on your first pass in order to achieve that target score. As you prepare for the test, be sure to reassess your progress constantly with practice tests. The number of practice tests you ultimately take kind of depends on a few different factors, like your initial score on your first practice test, your timeline for studying, and that target score that you're working towards. If your initial practice test yields a strong score, you may not need to take many more practice tests. You only need to take enough to know that you're able to replicate that high score that you got the first time. If you take several practice tests and do well every time, you know that you're on track to receive a high score when you sit down for the actual SAT exam. If you start off, however, with a low score on your first practice test, you'll want to take more practice tests on a regular basis. How often you should do so, once again, is based on when the test day is and how long you have to prepare. If your test day is really far into the future, you want to be able to space out those practice tests and be able to actually do studying in between each one. If your test is rapidly approaching, it may be a better idea to take plenty of practice tests more closely together and focus on studying the material that's giving you the most trouble while reviewing kind of the rest of the material that you're more familiar with in less depth. It can be difficult to find practice tests online, although there are some study books available. If you do buy books, remember that they have the most up-to-date information available because you have to remember that the SAT was recently revised in 2016. Make sure that any practice tests you use online are based on the most recent version of the test. The College Board offers free SAT practice tests. Since that's the organization that creates and administers the exam, it's a great source for practice materials that came right from the test maker. Use your practice test in the same way that you use your formative assessment. Score it carefully and keep identifying patterns in any mistakes you made to help guide the rest of your studying. Finally, you're gonna take the SAT. You're gonna take it and you're gonna take it again. Yes, we are serious about taking it again. Most students take the SAT more than once and most find that their scores increase most significantly between the first and second test administration. That means you should take the SAT at least twice unless you're one of the lucky few who exceeds your target score on your first try. If so, congratulations. You should plan on taking the test at least twice, and you should also allow time to take it three times, just in case. For more help preparing for the reading section of your SAT exam, you should check out our series of SAT tips and guides on our blog, which is available at blog.collegevine.com. Or for more personalized help, you can call today and subscribe to our email list online. Good luck with your SAT exam. Music